I absolutely love, or loved, if you will, my granny and papa. My dad's parents, they were some of the most directive points of my life. Some of the things that I've gained in my life, I gained from them. However, um, one of the greatest advices that they ever gave me was never speak of religion. Follow that one well. And don't talk about politics. Well, I'm going to kind of uh, break their hearts because I'd like to speak on both subjects today if I could. As time permits and as the Lord wills, I would, uh, I've sat down and I've considered a lot of things that are happening, and I'll tell you where this spurs from, uh, some things that have come about in the national news about trying to quell political speaking from the pulpit. Now, I make it a habit of mine never to preach politics. I do not endorse, if you will, any particular way or thing, but I do endorse the way of God. And what I was considering as to all of the things that we could discuss this morning was what is the church's responsibility to the government? Now, when I consider the times past, I can see where this works exceedingly well, and I can see where this has failed. In the early times of the church, probably somewhere about the uh, 5th and 6th century A.D., the church was so meshed with the government that it became known as the Holy Roman Empire. And those in that um, deviated form of the church that was created from this marriage of church and government um, would, would elevate certain religious people because of their endorsement of certain political parties, certain governments, certain countries, and it came to violence and bloodshed in the Lord's church. Well, in a deviated form of the Lord's church. Our duty as a Christian, first and foremost, is to give ourselves entirely to God. In our Wednesday night Bible studies, we have been studying the book of Romans, and most of our study this morning, the lesson this morning, will come from this. So if you'll go ahead and turn to the book of Romans chapter 12, I want to start with chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If you could ever say these are words to live by, uh, brethren, these are words to live by. Paul says to the church that is in Rome, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourselves and your bodies a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that you may demonstrate what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For the most part, individually, I can look out in the congregation and I can see that we understand this principle. Collectively as a nation, where do we stand? A few minor statistics I'd like to throw your way. According to the National Center for Health Statistics, Every 78 seconds in America, a teenager attempts suicide. Now, 
every 90 seconds, one of those teenagers succeeds. In the National, in the Center for Disease Control in Atlanta, 19 million new sexually transmitted disease infections occur every single year in our country. 50% of these occur in people in the ages of 15 to 24. The Guttmacher Institute reports that in America, one baby is aborted every 26 seconds. 137 babies will be aborted in America within the hour. That's just about every seat in this auditorium. Another statistic I'd like to share, according to a Focus on the Family poll, 47% of American families describe pornography as a problem in their families. And an MSNBC survey in 2000 reported that 60%, now this is staggering to me, 60% of all internet websites devoted and visited in 2000 or to pornographic sites. We have a concern in America. We turn to our government for help. And in some situations, and in some cases, we find the government not protecting us from these problems, but in other cases, through the legalization of immoral acts, supporting such situations. And it concerns us because as we strive very diligently to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, so many around us do not. And yet, we continue to pray. And yet, we continue to stand up and sing, God, bless America. For us to be considered to be blessed, we must collectively give a reason for God to bless us. When we look through history, we look at different cultures, we look at different communities, we look at different organizations, uh, countries, empires, and we say, why didn't they succeed? Why didn't the Greek Empire succeed? Why didn't the Roman Empire succeed? Politically, they had great thought. They had a great understanding. But they were spiritually bankrupt. We've got to reload the bank. We look at America's short, and I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, in almost 275, pushing 300 years, probably in my lifetime, if the Lord wills, I'll see the 300th anniversary of the nation. The question is, where have we come so fast in such a short amount of time. Comparatively, if you will, the Roman Empire existed for 1,200 years. Comparatively, we're a very young nation to go as fast as we have, as short as we have. The question is, what are we as Christians to do? And in relationship to government, 
What is my responsibility? In Romans chapter 13, after Paul has told us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, it's our reasonable service. We've discussed this before in the, in the congregation. Christ died for us. Our reasonable service is to live for Him holy and acceptable. But we take a look at our government. And we do not always agree with our government, as in who is in position. Of course, in America, we have a two-ish party system. We have other parties that come along, independent parties that rise. But traditionally, we've had a two-party system. Some will hold to one side of the party uh, and one particular party and its viewpoints, and others will hold to another party. But the question is, collectively, what's going on? In Romans chapter 13, Paul turns this corner and he says, let me address to you how a Christian should view government. Brothers and sisters, he's saying to the church of Christ in Rome, during the most persecuting era of the Roman Empire against Christianity, mind you, this is under Caesar Nero, he says, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, Romans 13.1. Excuse me, Paul? Nero is using Christians as a scapegoat for his massive urban renewal plan to destroy old Rome and build new Rome as he sees it. He's putting all the blame on Christians. The masses are buying into it. And the Christian persecutions are rekindled or thrashed. It will be under Caesar Nero's rule that Paul will die. It will be under Caesar Nero's rule that Peter will die. And he has placed all the blame. Thousands upon thousands of Christians will be crucified, will be, will be martyred beyond recognition will be cast into the arena for sporting game. All because of the name. And Paul says, let every soul be subject to governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinances of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs are due, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. Excuse me, Paul. Are you telling me that we have to lie down and let the government just have its way? Are we to not have a voice? That's not what Paul's saying at all. Paul is saying you submit yourselves because it is an organization put in place. What was the Bible verse? Be ye angry and sin not. 
Paul is saying that we have a responsibility to the government and he explains the rationale behind it why we should support an organized government. Government. Why? Because we are under God's control. Not the government's control. You see, the governments are under God's control. And let every one of you know this. A government that acts upon godly measures will be rewarded by a God under whose control they are placed. And a government that acts dishonorably before God will receive the same rendering as us when we take off all titles, when the ties are removed, whatever side of the aisle they sit on, we will all one day stand before God Almighty and we will help be held accountable for what we did, do, and what we didn't do. Romans 13, 1 through 4 says, Everyone who submits himself to the governing authorities, everyone must submit themselves, for there is no authority except by which God has established. The first, pur the first purpose of government is to reward good. Romans chapter 13, verse 3. But the second purpose of government is is to restrain evil. Romans 13, verse 4. So, you must ask yourself, what happens when a government goes beyond its governmental abilities to reward good and restrain evil? Well, the same thing as you and I, if we go beyond our responsibilities before God, we will be held subject and accountable for whatever we have done in violation of God's Word. It's as simple as that. We hold them high. We say, this is our government, and this is a political leader, and I support this one, and I don't that one, and I do this one, and I don't that one. But when you remove all titles, when you remove all positions, we are all people who must stand before God in judgment and must give an account of what we have done or failed to do. Now, understanding that we're under God's control and that governments are under God's control and when it all comes down to it, we're all just people, should give you a sense of responsibility. Because if we're all just people then we must understand that in some shape and in some fashion and in some form, we have an ability to communicate godliness. We cannot sit idly by. There have been times past that Christians have said, enough. There have been times... Excuse me. There have been times past when Christians have sat idly by and allowed, not governments, mind you, powers of evil to creep in and create destruction and create disharmony in the world. God will give to those who do His will good things in this earth. Maybe, but don't bank on it. God will give to those who do evil punishment in this world. Maybe, but don't bank on it. You see, because God is not focused on the physical. God is focused on the spiritual. 
And that is why as we look out into this world over history, we wonder why certain evil powers come into existence and do very well and reap and gain and have such pleasure. They say that some of the, um, of the drug lords that exist in this world live sumptuous lives. I recall a time reading of an article of a Colombian drug lord in South America who was arrested and placed in prison and had decorators come in and turn basically his prison into a great mighty condo where he had his own personal chef and he was able to conduct his business within prison. He used the police as protection. And we sit here and we wonder, how can governments allow that to exist? We live on terra firma, brothers and sisters. God does not reward nor punish in this life. But vengeance is mine. Thus saith the Lord. Second, we are to seek God's guidance. We cannot sit idly by, but we cannot sit idly by and upon our own understanding. If we're going to act, we're going to have to act with God's guidance. Take a look at a couple of verses here. Romans chapter 13, verse 5. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but because of conscience. Christians, who are the best citizens, need to rely on God's guidance for our nation. Consider the writings of the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 40 and verse 15. Isaiah 40 and verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as small dust on the scales. Look, the Lord lifts up the aisles as a very little thing. We, we, we live in fear of governments and of organizations. And the prophet Isaiah says, they're like dust on God's scales. They have no weight. They have no measure in the eyes of the Lord. So we must seek His guidance. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. I'm sure some of you have seen this on signs as you've traveled throughout the community. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and I will forgive them of their sin and I will heal their land. We need to be a trifold things. We need to humble ourselves. We need to pray to God and we need to seek God. Is that not what Paul says when he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before the Lord? But not only are we under God's control and not only are we to seek God's guidance, we're to follow God. God's will for our government. What is God's will? That the government reward good and punish evil. What happens when the government delves into matters that are beyond its God-given authority to do so? Well, first of all, we're to pray for our government. But we're also to pay for our government. Our financial investment through our tax system demonstrates two things. One, it demonstrates our submission to the government as God has commanded us to do, but it also allows us to have a voice, a say-so in our government. In our particular American system, we have chief executives 
throughout senators, throughout House of Representatives, and we have people that we can pick up the phone and we as an individual can issue a voice, issue a petition, issue an utterance of decree. In Matthew chapter 22, the, the scripture reading from this morning, uh, Jesus was being tempted about paying taxes and he looks at a particular coin and he says, whose image? Caesar's. Therefore you render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. But to God you render the things that are God's. What does God have in control? Everything. Absolutely everything. When you feel like your country is in turmoil, when you feel like the government is in unrest and upheaval, always remember God is in control. Do you seek the government or do you seek God? You must seek God. How 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Therefore I exhort, exhort first of all that all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and reverence, for that which is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. We must live a godly life. We must endorse and support God in all things. Or else, in judgment, when it really matters, we will be found without God. Governments come and go. As a matter of fact, we're in one particular governmental party right now, and that governmental party will change, and the faces of it will change, and then times coming will change, and the faces of it will change, and then the times coming will change, and the faces of it will change. Yet God never changes. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, the same today and the same forever. Now what is your duty? In the seconds that I have left, Matthew chapter 5 verses uh, 14 through 16. You have a power that you can use and you have a power that you can implement that will change government and it is your responsibility to God to do so. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do it, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You can make a difference by being godly and going out and living godly by teaching others the gospel of Christ, that Jesus came to this earth to die for all mankind, for those that would come to hear that and believe it, and repent of their sins, and confess Him as Christ, and be baptized for remission of their sins, then they go out. And it's infectious. And it's contagious. And you are here this morning. You are here this morning because someone had the godly duty to teach you the gospel of Christ. Whether it was a parent, whether it was a friend, or whether it was a total stranger who loved you in kindness, you are here this morning because someone taught you the gospel of Christ. Now, you must do the same. With our godliness, with our reasonable service, we can influence governments in this lifetime and in the next. Be ready. Be ready always to give a defense of the things that are in you. Stand up for God. Governments will come and go. I guarantee you, it's kind of like the weather in North Georgia. If you want it to change, just wait just a few minutes, it will. And the face of this government 20 years from now will not be the face that's in government. 
and the facing government 200 years from now may not look anything like the government that we're in right now. So if you're satisfied and everything is according to God's will, pray for thanks. If you're dissatisfied and everything is not in accordance to God's will, pray for change, but you yourselves be that living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable before God. Now, in this world, God has a focus to bring you to Him. Because there is one mountain that all mountains flow to, and that is the mountain of God, the house of the Lord. And He wants each and every one of us. If you're going to assail to one party, that's the party to assail to, is the party of the Lord. If you need to obey the Gospel, there is no better time than right now. If you find yourself a sway and different from the will of God, return to His favor. If you've obeyed those names, if you've named it, if you've obeyed that gospel from the heart and you've named that name, return before it's ever too late. Do so now. As together we stand and sing this song of encouragement.